Hey, good morning. Let's go ahead and uh, we're going to be started uh, seating today, sitting today. So go ahead and, and uh, you can sit uh, because uh, we are going to read the scripture. That's going to come. But I want to tell you a story first. By the way, if we haven't met, my name's Larry Young and I'm the retired pastor that still attends the church. So I pastored this church for 34 years. Um, here's a fun fact. The year that I started in 1985 was the year that Dustin was born. So, uh, so the church was a lot different in those days. And um, some of you were part of the church then, and you know it was, uh, it was very, very different. So praise God that uh, Holy Spirit's been drawing people, and the church is very uh, active and dynamic now. And uh, it's, it's changed a lot over the years. But anyways, one of the changes that occurred, of course, was building this whole new plant, which we did. We finished in 2006. And uh, we, I want to tell you today the story about moving the church bell. So, you know, we moved the original bell, the 1,000-pound bell, from the historic building over to this new church. It was new in 2006. And you can see Dave Henderson there with the bell. There it is in the historic church. And it was cast in Vermont. C.C. C. Beekman actually brought the bell up from San Francisco in 1880. So I don't know if all of you know that you're part of a very historic church. So the church was started in 1857. The church over on Six in California was finished in 1881. So that bell sat in the, and it was rung, of course, uh, we rang it every Sunday, up in the bell tower there at the historic church. Well, you can see there we uh, used some equipment to move the bell, and we, let's go ahead and flip through them, and then I'll keep telling the story here. Uh, so there's the bell coming out of the entrance to the church. And uh, this took place in early 2006. We put it on the back of a pickup truck. And you can see these are volunteers, by the way, these men who are standing there. These are church members, church volunteers that were part of this expedition. There's the bell coming out. And um, didn't want to drop that thing. <laughs> to kind of take care of your foot pretty well. If, uh, there's... Bunch of us, uh, there's me with dark hair, and uh, Jim Oaks, and Gene Cassette, and Marshall King, as we, we use pulleys to help kind of leverage the thing, get it balanced, and bring it down. So uh, eventually, we got the bell over here, of course, to the new church. Now, just to move the bell took some doing, because... The uh, Historic Architectural Review Commission and the city staff did not want us to move the bell. Uh, they voted against that, and so we had to appeal their decision to the city council, which we did in November of 2005. And I remember going down for the meeting, and we had our church attorney there, and we were making the case for moving the bell. But we could tell, I could tell, that it was not when the lawyer spoke. It was, they were not that convinced. So I had to get up and kind of make this impassioned plea, you know, basically begging them to let us... <laughs> move the bell. And so when they voted, it was four to two. They gave us permission to, to move the bell. And so we got it over here. And uh, the day that we put the bell up, that the workmen, and these were professionals that put the bell up in place. Uh, so the guy who was doing the final kind of, you know, attaching of the bell to the belfry up there, after he finished tightening the last nut and bolt there. He pulled out a harmonica, which he had in his back pocket, and he played Amazing Grace. <laughs> Pretty special. Something that we always remembered. And then I got to go up and be the first person to ring the bell. So that was kind of cool. So anyways, that's the story of the bell. Now, there, here we go. There's the bell. <laughs> In case you miss it on Sunday mornings, it's wrong every Sunday morning. Uh, okay, so you can appreciate it. And by the way, you have something to share with your friends when they come back from the all-church retreat. Say, hey, I found something out about the church that you, you probably don't know. So you can tell them. Okay, we're going to look at Psalm 90 today. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 90, 
And if you have a blue Bible there in the row, you find some extra Bibles there. It's on page 588. 588 in the, I guess we don't call them pews, in the chair Bible. The chair Bible. Okay, let's stand here for the reading of God's Word. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that's renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. And yet, their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And this is God's word to us this morning. Please be seated. So you might want to keep your uh, Bible open to that passage we're going to be looking at that in depth here today. Uh, today I want to preach on the stewardship of time. Time. You know, this is one of God's many gifts that he has given us. God's given us lots of different things. Creation. Did you see the sunrise this morning? Oh my goodness. I had to go out and take a picture. It was incredible. We live in a valley of beautiful lakes and mountains and trees. And what a privilege it is to live here. Do you ever take that for granted? I mean, this is a gift. God's given us a gift of being able to enjoy his handiwork. God's given us gifts of children and grandchildren and uh, spiritual gifts. And this fall, we're going to be looking at that in the various studies here that are being offered at the church. He's given us material blessings. Many, many different kinds of blessings. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift cometh from above. And one of the good, perfect gifts that God's given us is the gift of time. Time. So let's look at Psalm 90 and see what Moses, who wrote this psalm, has to say about time and its use. So... Moses here is talking about time in light of the fact that the Israelites and the Jews had been suffering. They'd been going through some hardships, some afflictions. And he mentions that a little bit later in the psalm. The Israelites were probably enduring some kind of disease or famine, perhaps a plague. Verse 12 is the key verse in the psalm. Let's all look at verse 12 for a minute. Moses says, he writes this to God in this prayer, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Let's all read that verse together. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now, we don't know how many days we have, you know, only God really knows that. How many days that we're 
permitted, allowed to live on this planet. So what does Moses mean when he talks about numbering our days? He means looking at time carefully, looking at time realistically, and using it carefully. Wise people look at time realistically, and they use it carefully. And that's the point of this psalm. So you'll notice if you have a sermon outline in your bulletins today, you were given a little insert, and it's going to require some filling in of the outline. So hopefully you have a pen or pencil. There's pens. There should be pens there in the little pockets. So you have your main point right up there at the top. Wise people view time realistically and use it carefully. If we could put that up on the screen, please, you'll see it up there. There it is. Wise people look at time realistically and use it carefully. So is that the way that you look at your time? The time that you are allotted, the time that you use every day? How careful are you with the use of your time? You know, I was thinking about this recently, and I thought about a time in my life in which I wasted a lot of time. And it was my senior year of high school. I think a lot of seniors waste time, <laughs> actually. After hearing stories in the patio in between services, I thought, oh, yes. I think that's just something about being a senior in high school. Well, anyway... I only had five classes. They were very easy classes. I didn't spend a lot of time, or I don't think I spent any time studying. And uh, we had an open campus. I went to a public high school in Central California coast. We were right on the beach. So I spent a lot of time at the beach with my friends. I did have to go to water polo and swim team practice. But our coach gave the seniors a lot of slack, so we were oftentimes late or no-shows. And my girlfriend went to another high school, so I would get my old 49 Chevy and drive over to see her. And then we would just kind of hang out. And then I would hang out with my best friend. But we developed a, uh, it was kind of a prank, against our school. And uh, it involved the use of stationary dots. Let's put those dots up there. So you can still buy these things. In fact, I have some here that I bought on Amazon recently. And uh, I'm not really sure what positive uses they have. I imagine crafts and art and, you know, uh, garage sales, stuff like that. Those are probably the more positive uses for these things. But what we did with them was we put them all over our school. I mean, we put them everywhere. We put them on trash cans, binders, bulletin boards, teachers' desks. They were all over the school. And of course, we did it when nobody was watching. So nobody knew where all these dots were coming from. There was one guy on the water polo team that we didn't like, Dave Wiesenfeld. He drove an old beat-up black Mercedes. And we have a picture in our yearbook of Dave Wiesenfeld's black Mercedes all dotted. So we hit everybody. Can you imagine spending hours of your time doing this? Uh, And then, you know, to top it off, we would write letters and we would post them in the bulletin board on the in the library, the church or the uh, school library. And these letters involved a conspiracy that these aliens were inflicting on the school. And uh, we got very creative in what we would write. We loved writing these things, and we loved even more. What gave us the biggest charge was watching the custodian or the uh, librarian, school librarian, read them, kind of shake her head, and then take them down. Now, not only were we vandalizing the school, we were wasting time for school custodians as well as our own time. And of course, in retrospect, I realize now what a waste of time it was. But as uh, that time, I didn't think it was a waste of time. I thought it was pretty funny. You know? I wasn't aware. I had just become a Christian, and I wasn't aware of Paul's words in Ephesians 5. You know these verses? Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. So there we have it. We're encouraged not only from Paul in the New Testament to use our time carefully, but also from Moses here in this particular psalm, Psalm 90. So how are we, or how can we use time wisely? Well, this is number one on your outline, in your fill-ins. We we want to remember that we have a limited amount of time on earth. Remember that we have a limited amount of time on earth. And the younger we are, the more we do not grasp that truth. The older we are, the more we get it, right? Let's look at our psalm here, beginning in verse 1. Moses writes in his prayer, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. The word, those, that phrase dwelling place means a safe place, a hiding place, a place of aid. So God has been our dwelling place. He has been our place of aid. He has been our hiding place for all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, this is verse 2, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Notice the present tense. You are God. God existed before creation, of course, because he's the one who created all that we see and that we enjoy. Created the heavens and the earth. God's infinite in his being and nature, unlike us. Human beings were constrained by time and space. We live in the kind of in the moment. A, a helpful way to look at this is by thinking about a movie. When you watch a movie, you watch the beginning, you know, the middle, and the end. That's the way that we have to see movies. Now, of course, you can rewind it and you can do different things like that, but that's not the way that God sees it. God sees everything right now. He sees it all currently. See, he's not bound by time and space. Now, God can enter time and space, of course, as he often does, but he's not bound by it like we are. So he's infinite in his being and his nature. Let's look at verse 3. You return man to dust. That word dust means crushed or pulverized matter. And we know that that's really our destiny, our bodies. By the way, I remember seeing a uh, t-shirt one day this guy was wearing, and it said, eat right, exercise, die anyway. (laughs) Oh, that's, (laughs) that's kind of our destiny, right? I mean, we can, we can eat the, di- the Mediterranean diet. We can exercise every day. And we're still, that's our destiny with these current mortal bodies is pulverized matter. That's what Moses is affirming here. And then he says this in reference, he's kind of referring back to verse 2 and verse 4 when he says, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past or as a watch in the night. He's talking about the The greatness of God. Man, a thousand years in your sight are just as yesterday. See? Again, affirming his infinite nature. Isaiah in his book says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He goes on in verse 5. You sweep them, meaning us, that's mankind, You sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that's renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. You know, the fact is the human experience is very fleeting and transitory. There's nothing permanent about our time here on earth. It's all moving, continuing to move. Recently, our church celebrated uh, one of our members, Cal Peiple's 100th birthday. And uh, Cal, is he was here at the first service. He sits up here in the front row, gets around with a walker, but man, the guy's got his faculties. 
And, uh, you know, it kind of raises the question, why does God allow some people to live like that and other people die at a much younger age? That's a pretty common question that we have. But we don't know the answer to that, do we? Only God knows. When I was in a seminary in one of my church growth classes, we learned an adage that went, work hard, but work smart. Work hard, but work smart. The fact is that you can be working hard doing a lot of things that really don't matter that much in the long run. And so I remembered that when I, of course, was hired as a pastor. And I thought, there's things, certain things that I really need to focus on and do well. I'm going to put my time and energy into. And other things that somebody else can do. That they don't really need the pastor to do that. So I'm going to let them do that, you see. So we need to be aware of how we're spending our time. How we're investing it. We want to know our job, whatever it is. You know, whether you're a businessman or a teacher, you know, a mom with little kids, it doesn't matter what, what you're doing right now, but you want to do it to the best of your ability and working smart. We also want to build leisure into life. So God doesn't expect us to work 24-7. He wants us to be able to take time off. That will make you last longer, <laughs> you know. So you can do what God wants you to do. So we want to remember that we have a limited amount of time on earth. Now, that brings us to number two. Number two is we want to recognize that sin distorts a godly use of time. Sin distorts a godly use of time. Notice in verse 7 and verse 8 that this subject of sin kind of almost suddenly appears out of nowhere. Verse 7 says, For we are brought to an end by your anger and by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. So if you're a careful reader, you're wondering, why does the subject of sin appear here when he's been talking about God's infinite nature and time. Well, remember I told you that the Israelites had been struggling with hardship and affliction. And uh, they were dealing with something um, as they came out of Egypt. In fact, let's turn back to Numbers 11. If you have your Bible there, turn back to Numbers 11. In the blue book or the Blue Bible there, it's on page 142 that I want you to go to, page 142. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt, uh, they were hungry, of course, and God gave them the gift of manna in the wilderness as they were out there. And so manna was this bread-like substance. But the people, you know, they ate it for a while, but they weren't that happy with it. I mean, they wanted some meat. And so they started complaining bitterly to God. And they were complaining to Moses, to the other leaders. They were wasting a lot of time. Here they were. They were supposed to be headed to the promised land. And they were complaining and using their time poorly as they spent this time complaining to God and to Moses. So look in verse 33 in Numbers 11. Here's what the Lord did after he gave them the quail. <laughs> While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. The Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. You see that? So God inflicted the people with this disease, this plague, because they were complaining. They were not happy. Here God was taking care of them. He had opened up the Red Sea for them to part. He was providing water for them as he had done, manna, and the people still weren't happy. So God didn't feel like they were, you know, weren't trusting him. They were sinning. They were not trusting God. So God reacted by inflicting this plague on them. So their sin, the lack of trust of God, resulted in them, this distorted use of time, resulted in them 
experiencing this significant uh, disease or plague. Now, sin distorts the godly use of time for us, too. Think about struggling with addictions. How much time do you spend dealing with that addiction? Whatever it might be, gambling, pornography, alcohol, doesn't matter. You invest a tremendous amount of time dealing with the addiction. And that addiction, whatever it is, can easily, of course, become an idolatry. And it can distort the way God really wants you to be using your time. Or if you get involved in an extramarital affair, you know, that can be time consuming. Trying to hide, you know, your spouse from it. It can be very time consuming. These sins can distort what God wants us to do with our time. On a more kind of uh, subtle level, let's say that uh, you work in sales. This is a hypothetical example. Let's say you work in sales, and your regional manager comes to you one day, and he says, uh, you know, Larry, you, uh, you were able to raise your performance, your sales uh, performance here this past year, 4%. That's great. You got your raise and your bonus, and you're all set. But next year, I want 6% increase from you. So you're going to increase from 4% to 6%. He says, uh, then he says this. You know, Bob Smith up in Eugene managed to increase his 8% last year. So how do you take that? Well, you could take that one of different, several different ways. But let's say you take it the way of, I am not going to let Bob Smith show me up. So you start working really hard, much harder than you've been working before. And you start not just putting in 45 or 50 hours a week, you start working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Because you're not going to let Bob Smith show you up to your regional manager. Now this is a much more subtle Form of sin. This is what we call, of course, pride, jealousy, envy. Do you see how sin can distort our use of time? To the point where if you're working those kind of hours, you know, you're not able to attend your kids, you know, soccer games or baseball games. Your worship uh, attendance becomes sporadic. It affects the way you live. It affects your time. So we want to be careful with the way we use our time, don't we? We have to recognize that sin can easily distort the way that we see it, the way we view it. Let's look in verse 10 for a minute. Verse 10 says, The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. And yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone. We fly away. You know, I heard uh, the late Tim Keller speak on this verse about 10 years ago at a conference I attended. And he was tying that particular verse in with a verse from 1 Peter chapter 2, in which uh, Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So, uh, Reverend Keller, Dr. Keller was talking about exiles and sojourners here on earth. That's what we are. And then he used this particular illustration. He said, you know, I get invited all over the world to speak at these conferences. And invariably, the organizers of the conference and the people that invite me to come speak will tell me something like, you know, we're going to put you up at such and such a hotel. It's the finest hotel in the city. It's five star. It's immaculate, beautiful, beautiful. Service is incredible. You'll really appreciate this place, having, uh, staying at this place. And Ken Keller says, he goes, you know, it would be that way. He said, the great places that they put me up would be fabulous. Great places. He said, but you know, I'm six feet, four inches tall. And at home, he says, I have the countertops. He said, they're custom built higher to be more level with where I am. He says, I have an extra long bed for my longer frame. 
And he says, as comfortable as those five-star hotels are, and as beautifully appointed as they are, as immaculate, and the service is incredible, he says, it's still not home. He says, I do not have comforts of home that I'm used to having. And then he said, it's the same way with us here. As great as our life can be here on this planet, and lots of us have a great life, it's still not our ultimate home. And that ultimate home is going to be really, really something, isn't it? Something that we have to look forward to. So that brings us to number three on our outline, and that is we want to realize that the only work which endures is work that God has established. Realize the only work that endures, that lasts, is work that God has established. And that's what we're going to move eventually here, of course, to verse 17, but that really reflects verse 17 well. But let's back up here to verse 13. It says, Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. Remember, I told you he was dealing with, they're dealing with this disease, this plague. And he's, this is the affliction, we think, that he's referring to. And for as many years as we have seen evil, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Isn't that the prayer that a lot of us have? Let your work be shown. God, let me see what you're doing. What are you doing in my life? What are you doing with this time that I'm investing for you? God, help me see it. That's kind of what he's, what Moses is praying here. Now look at verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish, that word means to affirm, to approve, to say yes to. Establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Notice how he repeats that. We want God to bless our efforts. We want God to bless our time. We want God to say yes to, approve what we're doing for him, right? I hope you do. I do. William James, the great philosopher, once said that the value of life is computed not by its duration, but by its donation. Isn't that true? It's not how long you live. It's what you're able to give. Think about Jesus. He only lived 33 years. That's not very long. We would say today, if somebody only lived 33 years, that their life was cut tragically short. But look at his donation. Oh, my. What did he donate? He gave his life. He shed his innocent blood. No man, no woman has ever given what Jesus gave. Jesus gave us the gift of salvation. He opened up the gates of heaven for us so that our destiny would not be just crushed, pulverized matter, <laughs> but would be souls living in, in eternity with our Lord and Master. That one day when he comes again in glory, we're going to be given a new spiritual body that will be recognizable. We'll get to enjoy the benefits of heaven on earth. This will be a new, a whole different planet, a whole different way of functioning. There will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. So let me ask you, as I kind of wind it up here, 
What's your legacy going to be? What will you be remembered for? What will your friends and family members say about you when you're gone? How will they remember you? Will they remember you as a man or woman of faith and integrity? Somebody who lived their faith? The way that you treated people? The way that you treated customers if you have a business? The way you talk to other people? And talked about other people? Will they remember that about you? Will that be your legacy? You know, I'm sure glad that uh, God allowed me to live beyond my senior year of high school. (laughs) I shudder to think about being remembered as one of those guys who spread crazy stationary dots all over the school. So I hope you're thinking about that as you spend your time. How will I be remembered? You know, it seems like the older we get, uh, the more we think about those kind of things, right? Right? What will our legacy be? I want to encourage you, regardless of your age, to remember that wise people view time realistically and they use it carefully. Let's pray. Thank you. We thank you, our Father, for the gift of time. Uh, Forgive us when we waste it, use it carelessly. Make us aware of ways we can use it more productively, efficiently, effectively for you and for your kingdom. Help us to learn, if we haven't already, Lord, help us to learn our spiritual gifts so we can put them to use for you and for your kingdom. And uh, help us in our quest. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.